Hi everyone, I'm Margot Price, the Director of Alumni Relations for the School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine here at Tulane. Thank you all so much for joining us today for our webinar, Addiction Policy and Practice. Our moderator today is Dr. Patty Kissinger, Class of 1992 and current SPHTM Professor and Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs and Development. Our panelists, Alex Duncan, Class of 2004, and Sushan Chukla, Class of 2009, will speak with us today about their work within the realm of addiction policy and practice from their perspective lenses, how they arrive in their current professions, and the ways in which their work with policy and practice intersect. I encourage all of you to please utilize the chat feature today with any questions that you may have for our panelists. I hope you enjoyed today's webinar and thanks again for joining us. Thank you so much, Margot. That's a really um, great introduction. So we are really excited and happy to have two of our excellent alum um, on the panel. Um, and I will I will let them introduce themselves. But we have Dr. Alex Duncan who uh, and Dr. Shuchin Sukla. And they both work in substance abuse. And substance abuse is so, so prevalent in the United States. It's highly prevalent in New Orleans. Over 40 million people have substance use disorders. One in seven people in the United States have them. Thirteen million, thirteen billion dollars in cost, and I'm sure the other panelists will speak more to this. One in five people who are incarcerated have substance use as one of the reasons that they're incarcerated. So, I'm so I am uh, a, almost a four-year uh, Tulanian. I came um, in 1986 to do my master's, then I did my doctorate. Then now I'm working as a professor, I'm associate dean, and also I'm a proud parent of uh, a Tulane student. So I'm really happy to be here. And I would love to have um, Alex, if you could please introduce yourself, Dr. Duncan, and then Dr. Shukla, if you could introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, I'm Alex Duncan. Um, I work at the Pew Charitable Trust, and Pew is a nonprofit, nonpartisan research and policy organization. I sit in Pew's Washington, D.C. office. I work for Pew's Substance Use Prevention and Treatment Initiative, where we work at the intersection of research and policy. And a lot of my work is at the intersection of the criminal legal system and substance use disorder. And I also do work in maternal and child health. Great. Thank you so much, Alex. Shuchin? Hey, everyone. I'm Stuchin Shukwa. I'm a family doc by training and addiction medicine um, board certified provider as well. I'm at an organization called Mayhack. You can see uh, right, one of these two. I can't. <laughs> one of those two, Mayhack. It stands for Mountain Area Health Education Center. It's a residency program. Um, it's affiliated with UNC School of Medicine. Um, so we have med students here. Uh, and then we provide a variety of clinical services to our clinical departments. Pleased to be here. Great, thank you so much. So I'm going to start with the first question, and this is going to be addressed to both of you. So um, tell me about your current, well, you told us a little bit about your current role, but what was your aha moment? Like what drew you to substance use uh, research or, or, or counseling or, or care? Uh, maybe Suchin, would you like to go first, please? Yeah, um, I, uh, so I did my MD and MPH at the same time at Tulane, um, 05 to 09. And um, if anyone in the audience is an MD and PhD student, you probably know what I mean when I say that those are pretty divergent views of how health and wellness and suffering and death work in America, whereas Western medicine and kind of the medical establishment is very much focused on individual health outcomes um, and sort of the vertical alignment of health issues and spending. Public health is broader. It's looking at populations. It's looking at um, the quality of evidence for the greatest number of people. And so those were divergent in, in my training, um, but I have had a great opportunity to kind of bring them together in my work, um, specifically because um, I'm drawn to like the biggest health issues of our, of our generation. Um, and so I started my work more in the HIV and Hep C world. Um, and then it was obvious that addiction, and this is in the you know, mid 2010s, it was obvious that addiction and opioid overdose was becoming a highly prevalent, highly um, uh, accelerating problem across the country. And so I moved to Western North Carolina in 2017 uh, from New York. And that was when it was really clear, like there is a dearth of leadership, a dearth of providers, a dearth of trained um, clinical staff that can manage this issue for the needs of the population really is emblematic of the rest of the country. And so um, it's sort of like, what else would I be doing, right? Like <laughs> as a physician, why, why am I in the game? If I'm not trying to deal with the bigger problems. Great. Thank you so much. That's excellent. Alex, what, what got you into the uh, substance use um, prevention, treatment, all of that? 
uh, similarly, I also came to this work through um, HIV research um, and treatment. So I have been, uh, I did my MPH at Tulane and then I did my doctoral work at Columbia University in, in uh, New York City and then my postdoctoral work at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. And so I, I came to this work through HIV. So I, at Tulane, I was working with a professor, Adam Becker, on one of his um, HIV projects. And he was working with African-American young men who have sex with men. And as part of that work, we were um, you know, really engaging with the community, doing a lot of community-based participatory research. And then after that project, and I kind of moved on in my career, I continued to work in HIV through several projects, including when I was at the New York City Department of Health. Um, I worked in HIV there. And, I, and a lot of the individuals that I was working with, the clients talked about their substance use and how their substance use impacted their HIV care. And that's how I said, you know what, I really need to be tipping my toe in both HIV and substance use disorder. And, you know, the rest is history. And I've been working in this field my entire adulthood. Yeah, we often talk about the syndemics of HIV substance use, but there's many syndemics as far as substance use because it's really sometimes people are self-medicating for mental health issues. So, so that's really too. And I know that both of you worked together before and you didn't even know that you were both from Tulane. So tell me about that experience. I don't know who would like to go first. Maybe Alex, do you want to go first? What? How yeah. did you find out? Yeah, actually, uh, it wasn't me who made the connection with Suchin who made the connection. So it was one of, so one of my work lines of work is ensuring that individuals who are incarcerated have access to opioid use disorder treatment. And so for one of my state projects, I was working in a Southern state trying to assist the Department of Corrections in offering medications for opioid use disorder, which are methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. Um, of note, failure to provide medications for opioid use disorder to people who are eligible for that medication is a violation of the American with Disabilities Act. I just wanted to say that. And so when I um, work with prisons and jails, it's always best for them to find a peer to talk to. They, you know, departments of corrections like to talk to departments of corrections. Correctional officers like to talk to correctional officers. Correctional health staff like to talk to other correctional health staff. So I need to find a peer for these individuals to really talk to, and it'll resonate with them. So as expected, working in a Southern state um, with the Department of Corrections to find a program that was providing comprehensive medications for opioid use disorder, there is, you know, not that many to choose from. So I heard about the North Carolina Department of Corrections small buprenorphine program, and I learned that Suchin's organization was providing buprenorphine care. And so I just cold emailed him and, um, <laughs> and asked if he would be willing to come to this Southern state that I was working in to meet with the Department of Corrections there to tell them about the North Carolina program. And so he graciously agreed, we became fast friends and we didn't even know that we both went to Tulane until I picked him up from his hotel for breakfast and he brought it up. Ah, yeah, that is amazing. Well, the Tulane network is very large and it's very robust. And so that's really great. Uh, Suchin, do you have anything to add? Was that a... Uh, uh, did you know that no. that was going to happen or was that? No, uh, uh, accurate prediction uh, description, but it just, it not only is the Tulane network large, but I also think it's a small world of like-minded individuals because I think, you know, some of the connections Alex and I made are similar to other connections I've made with other colleagues around the country doing similar work. And just, I don't know, it's just a funny thing. Um, this problem is so large and yet it's a kind of narrow group of folks doing work, especially in this um this intersection of substance use and criminal justice system, which I mean, by the way, very much plays into, um, you know, historically um, race-based uh, drug control policies and the war on drugs and ties into politics and economics. And it just really kind of going back to your first question, Dr. Kissinger, it's really uh, uh, addiction is emblematic of sort, sort of some of the deeper issues of American society. So it's just really cool that, um, you know, to be around like-minded individuals doing really awesome work. And I was just, I worked in, um, a variety of agencies doing kind of multidisciplinary work, but I've never worked with like someone who's a public health person with a team of pub public policy people who like know down to the uh, county level what's happening at state government and, and who votes for what. So it was just fascinating how uh, the kind of science of public health intersects with the, I guess, the public policy piece and how, do, how does the machinations of government work. 
from bench to trench or all the way through to politics, that's or all the way through to policy, really, really important. So um, for our audience, I just wanted to know if you could touch a little bit on some of the major roadblocks you've had and how you, and what advice would you have for people that might wanna get into substance use um, policy or care or public health? Um, who would like to go first? Uh, maybe Suchin, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, As a clinician, maybe you have a different perspective than Alex, who has more policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and I, I actually think this is true for a lot of public health issues in that um, the, the healthcare technology needed to solve these issues are there. And they've been there for a long time. I mean, buprenorphine was approved by the FDA for clinical use for opioid addiction in 2002. Methadone's been around, I think, since the early 70s. Um, and these tools are super effective when you compare it to even uh, medical treatments for a variety of other common medical issues, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease. Um, nothing quite has the number needed to treat, uh, number needed to treat as uh, medication for opioid use disorder. So the hard part is implementing uh, the science. Um, uh, and, you know, in some places they call this translational medicine or whatever. But the truth is we're, we're working against the grain uh, and it's a very specific American issue of uh, a 50 to 60 year history of a war on drugs where the criminal justice approach was the primary method of addressing substance use, thinking that this was a moral failing, that this was a choice, people just trying to get intoxicated. When uh, if you look at the way substance use works, both at the individual level as well as at the population level, it performs just like any other, really a communicable disease. It has risk factors, it spreads within families, it has a genetic component, it has an environmental component. It, it looks, sm smells and breathes just like any other medical problem and is amenable to medical therapy, just like even more so than the average medical problem. So the challenge really is um, man-made, and this is probably familiar to anyone in public health. It's the problems we've created for ourselves. It's the stigma and bias. It's the lack of resources. Um, and it's the, uh, especially in the last year, the rapidly evolving nature of the substance abuse issues facing America. So I say those as challenges, but I, I don't know if challenges are the right word because I think it's par for the course, right? This is what uh, Dr. Duncan and I get paid to do, to work out the solutions, to uh, speak eloquently to rural sheriffs who don't really trust the science until so you sit with them and talk to them and listen to them over and over again. So the work is just needs to be done. And I actually am quite optimistic that, um, especially with the really in high levels of state, federal, and private funding that's going toward this problem, that we as a, as a nation, as a community, can really address this issue. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Duncan, do you have anything to add or any different challenges you've faced? I agree with all those challenges. I'll, I'll underscore another challenge or well, two other challenges. One is, you know, sustainability of programs that we know work. You know, grant money dries up. Grant money's not as nimble as it should be to respond to emerging trends. So that's something that a lot of the providers and people who run programs talk about. And another challenge from a policy perspective is that policy moves slow. And so, you know, we'll know from a research standpoint what we should do. We know from a clinical standpoint what we should do. But sometimes if we have to wait on legislation to help move things along, that's a slower process. And that becomes challenging for people who need access to services, who need funding for programs rather immediately to address the needs of their communities. So true. It's um, you can't take the public out of public health, and policy takes a long time. That is for sure. You know, I sometimes you work at, at your whole career is just to change one policy. So that that is true. Um, how about uh, addiction in the U.S. healthcare system? Do you see anything specific to the U.S. healthcare system that is either facilitating or impairing uh, the appropriate care or policies that we need for for those who suffer from substance use disorder? Well, I mentioned, uh, you know, kind of how policy takes a while, you know, there's a lot to be learned from, you know, other countries that embrace, you know, a lot of the evidence that we do not need to be as prescriptive as we are in terms of access. Um, the pandemic has actually been a great, you know, 
test case for us to see how we can provide treatment relatively quickly, like low barrier buprenorphine to ensure treatment is provided quickly, safely, without a bunch of hoops, with methadone for um, take home medications, 14 days or 28 days, depending on that person's um, stability. You know, those are things that other countries have been doing. It took us, you know, a pandemic for us to really, you know, demonstrate that individuals can manage their own health care and do so safely. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times, you know, policy is slow to change. Um, legislation is so, slow to change. And for some of the things that show that individuals can use their medication safely, it's a regulatory change, which is easier than a legislative change. Um, but those things still take time. Our agencies still need times to review the evidence. They still have to go through public comment periods. Um, so I'll just offer that. And I'm sure Suchin has some perspectives to offer from a clinical standpoint as well. Great. Dr. Shuka, anything to add from the clinical perspective? Yeah, and I'd start by the, the positive because I'm gonna say negative stuff next, but the positive is things are changing um, very rapidly in the last year or two, um, come from the, the current White House of changing some of those barriers to providers getting um, their uh, credentials to treat bup uh, with buprenorphine um, uh, for opioid use disorder. But um, so I think things are improving and I, I can list off some of those things. But um, in regards to your original question, like what in the healthcare system is a barrier to, to addressing substance use in the community? I think it really comes down to training first and foremost. We, um, for you know, a lot of medical education, and I love my time at Tulane, but a lot of med medical education is built out of the 50s. Um, a lot of healthcare billing is built out of the 50s and 40s before we had the levels of healthcare technology we have. But uh, aside from that, training um, really is, has moved towards specialization um, or not moved towards is maintain that that um, that structure, and and whereas uh, mental health is already siloed away from general health care, substance use was even farther siloed away from mental health care. And I think in the chat box, someone pointed out that there are pathways to getting credential to be an addiction provider. I myself have been credentialed through the American Board of Preventive Medicine after doing you know the number of hours and years of work uh, in the field. Um, so I think there are pathways, and there's also um, changes with. Uh, the DEA uh, requirements for all providers to get trained in addiction and, and opioids and, and substance use care. Um, and med school is really embracing this more than they did when I was a student. But as a student and even as a resident, I got very little education around substance use, a lot more education around porphyria and, and weird rashes and stuff that's one out of a million. When, as you said, Dr. Kissinger, substance use is in our communities and our families. It's highly prevalent across American society, across socioeconomic uh, um, categories. And so I think part of the, what's missing in the healthcare system is the way to staff uh, and, and capacity build to meet the needs of, uh, of the community. And so we're, we're playing catch up and the problem is going faster is, than we can keep up with it. But I, I think the future is bright because I see more and more resources going towards training providers and, and communities on how to handle this. And Dr. Shiglo, what kind of provider should get this training? Everyone the, or, yeah. I mean, every provider, I don't know, knows about hypertension, right? Even if you're a dermatologist, you know about hypertension because it's extremely prevalent and affects everything you do, no matter what kind of provider you are. I would, I mean, I'm biased here. Of course, I'm an addiction focused provider, but I would say every provider needs to be trained in this. You know, in my conversations with local sheriffs and law enforcement and lawyers and judges who are currently the main treaters of addiction in the way American healthcare is structured, they would agree that like, why are healthcare providers not taking the lead in this? Why are the cops having to manage mental health and substance use issues in our community? Um, but I think, you know, a lot of providers are like, whoa, yeah, I was taught that these are doctor shopping patients or that they're going to try to lie to me. And, and so they have, you know, I was taught that. I, I have firm memories of attendings sort of instilling me this idea that these are negative people with negative agendas that are outside the scope of what is medical decision making. Um, and that was wrong. And I think it's widely acknowledged that that's wrong. And I was part of that too, but I, I think things are going to improve. That's great. Um, so I noticed that you said, so like pediatricians, I guess those are people that should also, pretty much all of them should be trained. What are the special issues surrounding adolescents and substance use? And that could be for either of you two, if you want to cover. Uh, 
great question. Uh, I mean, one is that um, if folks are seeing the news and the news inflates and sensationalizes things, of course, but we are seeing an uptick in accidental overdose. And I, I, I keep in mind all overdose is accidental. It's very, or most overdose is accidental. Most people are not trying to overdose and get hurt, but um, it's even more accidental with adolescents who are now, you know, purchasing uh, drugs like uh, Adderall and stimulants and Xanax, things that are maybe not as dangerous buying those things off, uh, you know, social media sites and, and you know, less uh, places where you don't know who you're buying it from and, and contamination of the, those drug supplies with fentanyl and other opioid analogs um, is becoming a bigger issue. And so we're seeing these reports of younger people who have no opioid use disorder, who would not necessarily fit the criteria for a substance use disorder, who are overdosing and dying. So I think that's problem number one. That's the one that's more sensational. And I say that because I'm supposed to say it, but the bigger problem is that if you look at the data, the people who overdose are people in their 20s and 30s. They didn't start with their substance use disorder in their 20s and 30s, they started in their teens. And if you go farther back, it's those adverse childhood experiences, ACEs, that really predispose those folks to having uh, developed a substance use disorder, which later leads into things like uh, addiction and, and risk of overdose. And all that's really based on um, this this uh, cycle of of um, of trauma. And so, folks, if you can imagine a teenager whose father was incarcerated for crack cocaine in the '80s, now has an adverse childhood experience. If you aren't familiar with those, I can share a link. But there are risk factors for developing addiction and suicide risk and and things like that in the future. That father who's incarcerated now puts that young young person at risk for future development, and then the cycle perpetuates because. That person's either going to be at risk of having health care issues or criminal justice issues, which now begets the next generation. And so there's a need to address that cycle, not only by preventing overdose, which, you know, the house is on fire. We need to put the fire out, but also we need to build the resilience and address those ACEs that keep perpetuating. Uh, and I'd say specifically, as, as the work I've done with Dr. Duncan, really addressing what's missing in the way we approach addiction through the criminal justice system and what can we do better. Yeah, that is so true. Um, and we're seeing a very troubled uh, adolescents, particularly in New Orleans, but actually all over. Um, and so I was wondering, Dr. Duncan, if there's any policies that um, you think are really needed uh, as far as adolescents or, or anything in general with substance use, uh, uh, where, where are we headed with policies? What are you working on most recently? Yeah, well, one thing, you know, to just uh, piggyback on the youth part is that, you know, the medications are FDA approved for methadone 18 and older, buprenorphine, naltrexone 16 and older. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to say that because, uh, you know, a lot of for young people that do have, you know, an opioid use disorder specifically and need medications and might be younger, they might be hard pressed to get access to these medications unless a provider is willing to provide that off label. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Now, in terms of kind of policy and kind of what we should be thinking about, the biggest thing that I'm that I'm wa um, watching now is a lot of the reauthorizations. So the reauthorization of the substance use disorder prevention that promotes opioid recovery and treatment for patients and communities act, that's the support act of 2018, um, is up for reauthorization. And what we expect is that all of the substance use disorder related um, legislative vehicles will jump on that one. Um, so we're following that closely. We're seeing what legislation is gonna come out. One thing, because I'm very interested in the intersection of the criminal legal system and substance use disorder is the Reentry Act. Um, that is um, a piece of legislation that would allow Medicaid to cover um, individuals who are 30 days prior to release from incarceration. That's a big deal. Um, and that one does require legislation. If and what do they do specifically for those folks? So currently the way that it works in correctional health care is that public insurance programs like Medicare, Medicaid, CHIP are not able to reimburse for, for health services while a person is incarcerated unless a person has a 24 hour inpatient hospitalization. There are some exceptions that just recently passed. For example, um, California got um, an 1115 waiver approval from CMS that will allow um, the reimbursement of selected 
correctional health services in the 90 days prior to a person's release. So that's more for a continuation of care. And in the most recently passed um, omnibus bill at the end of this year, there were two provisions for youth. So this actually ties on to the previous question that allows for the reimbursement of some services for youth who are incarcerated in juvenile justice facilities and requires that states have to do a Medicaid reauthorization if that young person had CHIP prior to their entry into the juvenile justice um, center. So those are the things I'm watching. There's also a lot of telehealth um, legislation with respect to Medicare that I'm following as well. And all of these things are very important to ensure that individuals who need access to services can easily access services without a bunch of hoops. That is great. And I, you know, I see that telehealth is a way. So um, Tulane is committed to equity, diversity, and inclusion. I wanted to see what you thought, th how you think that substance, substance use and disuse um, or misuse um, uh, plays into, uh, it disproportionately affects minoritized people. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on, you know, how that is happening or what can be do done to combat that issue. Yeah, I'm sure uh, Shushan also has some things to say. So um, I can speak with respect to, you know, racial and ethnic disparities, like all areas of healthcare, racial and ethnic disparities also persist in addiction. One of the main things that we can make sure that we're doing is um, public health people and folks that also do research is to make sure we disaggregate data by race ethnicity. That is important because that way we can see that overdoses among Blacks and Hispanics or Latinx community increase more dramatically than whites. Um, data from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, HRQ, shows that nationally between 2013 and 2017, deaths from synthetic opioids um, other than methadone increased 18 fold among black people and 12 fold among Hispanics compared to nine fold among white people. And that was before the pandemic. And so we wow. know what's going on with the, with the pandemic. Um, another thing I want to mention is there was a nice paper from um, Deborah Furholden and colleagues using um, CDC data that also shows African Americans outpace whites with respect to overdoses. Now, if we switch to treatment, um, when it, uh, Legisletti and colleagues shows that Black patients had historically lower odds of receiving buprenorphine um, mm -hmm. at an ambulatory care visit as compared to whites and people who report um, other races. And this is despite evidence from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health showing that the prevalence of opioid misuse is generally similar among Blacks and white adults. So from a policy and research standpoint, disaggregating data by race seems like um, you know, a no-brainer. But if we don't do that, we run the risk of perpetuating inequities by not telling a comprehensive story. Yeah. Yeah, it's really about the story, isn't it? So important. Dr. Shukla, do you have anything you'd like to add? Like in your own practice, do you see um, that certain groups are have more difficulty with anything, with getting treatment or coming to care or anything? Yeah, um, I'll start by saying, you know, I did my training and then years of work after residency in the Bronx, which is uh, very much non-white and a lot of uh, Spanish speakers, um, and a high concentration of methadone clinics uh, compared to buprenorphine providers. If you look at Manhattan, which is richer and whiter, a lot more buprenorphine um, uh, comparatively than the Bronx uh, and less methadone. Um, for anyone doing clinical medicine, let me start by saying methadone and buprenorphine, equally efficacious, equally good at preventing overdose, equally good at preventing uh, harm and HIV and hep C transmission, good medicines. However, very, very different regulatory framework. Uh, methadone, uh, for those of you who aren't aware, can only be provided through opioid treatment programs. Uh, methadone clinics is a, sort of the uh, common parlance. And, uh, and there's a lot of rules. You gotta go six days a week usually for at least a couple months. And then if you're passing your drug test, then you can start going five days a week for a month or two, and then four days a week. And so you slowly earn that credit. Um, and it feels like credit and it feels like jail. Having worked in one of those facilities, there's often a security presence. Everyone in my rural town, at, well, not my Asheville, but the counties next door, everyone knows if your car's parked out there. I mean, there's a whole lot of stigma if you're going to go to a methadone clinic. There's no way to hide, um, and there's no way to overcome the the kind of um, the the feeling there. It doesn't feel like a warm and fuzzy place. Whereas buprenorphine, you could I prescribed it in my family medicine clinic alongside 
Um, there's pregnant patients and children. And so it's clear that there's a racial uh, dynamic, as, as Dr. Duncan pointed out, in treatment access. You can look state by state, states that have Medicaid expansion versus non-expansion, and where the race demographic state there for those that even have Medicaid, what is, you know, what are the, uh, the challenges and barriers to getting treatment? Um, those are all kind of, as you would expect, uh, considering American history. Currently, I'm in Western North Carolina, which is a very white part of America, very different from my experience in New Orleans, where I grew up, and different from the Bronx. But you'd see the same challenges amongst uh, the working poor and below in that uh, rural access is very challenging. There's less providers. You know, transportation is different in the mountains, as uh, I learned quickly moving here. Like 10 miles in one direction is not the same as going from like, you know, Gretna to, I don't know, the, the airport or whatever. Um, in the mountains, it, it can take a lot longer depending on the weather. And if you need your bup refill for me today, and I'm required to do it in person, that's the difference between you having an this weekend or not. I mean, it's super critical medicine. And you can just, I can count the, the litany of barriers between life and death for that patient. Um, and so I think telehealth is a super important access point that's really improved uh, treatment access for certain populations through the pandemic. Um, Medicaid expansion, also really important. And, and the work Dr. Duncan and Pew is doing around criminal justice, critically important. UNC came out with a study years ago showing that the overdose rate for folks in the first month out of jail or prison is 40 times higher in North Carolina or in North Carolina prison system, jail system, than for the general population. And so that's like the highest overdose risk beyond, I guess, somebody um, surviving a non-fatal overdose. And so if you compare that with the fact that the number one cause of death for many, many years in a row now for people under age 50 is overdose, over suicide, over uh, gun violence, over cancer, heart disease, it's overdose. Super treatable, super preventable. Like, so we need to, we need to build the infrastructure to address those, those barriers and challenges. And, uh, and telehealth and access is, is really important part of that puzzle. Yeah, I heard both of you speak of stigma, and so that's really an important thing. One of the um, ways of getting around stigma is harm reduction. Um, so Ethan, who's in the audience, says he grew up in Oregon, which decriminalized drug possession through a program called Measure 110. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, and so he says that he thinks that stopping, you know, treating it more like a medical issue and stopping it, you know, don't treat it like a criminal issue. Um, he thinks that that might be more, uh, you know, there, that that might be more beneficial. I just want to see what you thought about different harm reduction. So now we're, you know, everybody should be trained on Narcan. We should have, uh, you know, we should have needle exchange and all that stuff. Is there anything else you can think of in as far as harm reduction? And had you heard of the Oregon uh, program? And if you had any thoughts on that, um, either? Anybody want to talk on that? Uh, I'll start. Um, I haven't heard of that particular uh, bill, but I, I do know that decriminalization is a prevalent issue in conversations in the addiction medicine world. Um, you know, I first start by separating it a little bit because I certainly have my own personal beliefs um, uh, that I, I think most could uh, imagine. But um, but I, I want to emphasize that while things like decriminalization and even some really evidence based elements of harm reduction are still a little politically controversial. Um, I'd say it's it's pretty clear that there's bipartisan support for things like decriminalization in general and access to evidence-based treatment for things like addiction. Um, you know, you have the Koch Brothers Foundation that supports a, a lot of uh, efforts to decriminalize and, and reduce the jail and prison population uh, alongside really far left-leaning organizations. Um, you know, I, I'm not- That's pretty that's, bipartisan. Yeah, <laughs> that is, that's the epitome of bipartisan, yeah. <laughs> and the reason I want to go first is because Dr. Duncan's going to speak much more eloquently than me. But, um, you know, when it comes to drug arrests and drug sentencing and convictions, if you look at the history of the last 60 years, folks that are getting incarcerated are non-white people. Black and Hispanic are much more likely than white populations to be incarcerated, though white populations have higher rates of substance use general in general. That being said, those folks in jails and prisons are often not people with they're, you know, dealing hard drugs or whatever you see on CSI and all these shows um, that are absolutely not based in reality, as, as entertaining as they are. It's usually low level people who have addiction. It's usually for low weight marijuana arrests. And it's usually people who uh, would be very amenable to treatment. We're not talking about even the middle management in drug, uh, drug you know, um, trafficking organizations, let alone the kingpins. It's all the 
super low level people. So when, and I love my law enforcement folks because they are definitely at the front lines of addiction. Like I have to be partners with them and I want to be partners with them. But when you see these uh, news shows with these like tables full of guns and drugs, that's not really reflective of what's happening in, in drugs in America. Most people caught up in this are people with mental health issues, with um, ACEs and other um, risk factors for addiction, and people who have j just had housing. You don't even need to give them treatment. If you just gave them shelter that was sustainable, they would probably survive a lot better and recover a lot better without even any treatment. And so we have a built problem rather than an inherited problem, a built problem that we built that's really limiting uh, certain groups, but all groups really uh, access to uh, healthy options for their life. So it sounds like you're saying some of the media is propelling some of this stigma and that's that's not very helpful. I have to tell my husband because he's a journalist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll say, hey, you guys, you got to present it a little bit more unbiased. So um, Dr. Duncan, anything to add to that? Yeah, Dr. Shukla said a lot of things that, um, you know, I really agree with that, you know, I wear my employer's hat for this particular um, webinar. So I'm limited to saying certain things that um, fall within the line of work that I do. So I, you know, I definitely can't say all of my personal opinions about, you know, this question. So I will just add a couple. We of might have to bleep it out anyway. Just kidding. <laughs> but I'm sure you all can read between the lines. But, you know. Uh, I'll just add a couple of things to the question um, and in response to Dr. Shukla's comments. So yes, we all need to have Narcan. I travel with it every day. I keep it in my backpack because you just never know when it's an opportunity to save a life. And, you know, I was on the bus one day going to work. This was before the pandemic and someone looked to be in crisis. So I was like, well, let me pull out my uh, Narcan just in case. And, you know, I made sure that he was breathing. So he was ultimately fine and he didn't need the Narcan. But those are the things that you just want to make sure you have that on them. So we need to make that make sure that people are aware of that medication and how to use it. Low barrier buprenorphine already mentioned that. Um, I also want to touch on um, overdose prevention sites. That's something that, you know, in my current hat that I'm wearing for this webinar, I can't speak to. Maybe Dr. Shukla would want to speak to that. But I do want to point out that overdose prevention sites is not something that my project currently works on, but there is evidence out in the field that it has been helpful in saving lives and it has been um, helpful to connect people to services. Great. Yeah, I'll take that prompt. Um, the evidence is pretty clear that people don't overdose and die at a overdose prevention site, despite the substance use that can happen there. And in fact, in the regions around, and you know, we have pretty good data just from Vancouver, let alone from uh, various European countries about these, these centers, but even the area around uh, an overdose prevention site, if you look at the, you know, one mile radius, um, you have reduced needle litter, you have reduced HIV and hep C transmission, you often have improvements in public safety, um, and so the evidence is pretty clear that these, these things are really effective. It is not a cure-all, and I actually think decriminalization is definitely not a cure-all, um, but it, it should be an important piece of the puzzle of, of how we address how bad the fire is burning. I mean, we have not peaked, or maybe we're just about peaked with our overdose rates nationally, but um, you know, with xylazine and some of these other contaminants coming into the drug mix, uh, I don't think we're even close to out of the woods yet. And I did, sorry, Dr. Kissinger, I, I, I can babble. So I didn't no, want to go back. You're to, doing great. Keep going. <laughs> I did want to go back to decriminalization because though I think it can be helpful for reducing the jail and prison population, which by definition puts that individual at risk, specifically when they leave jail or prison, and also reduces the risk for future generations now that we have one less ACE. I also think that uh, it can be done poorly. For one thing, if you just decriminalize it without addressing all the issues that were causing people to get incarcerated, whether rightfully or wrongly, you're not going to help anyone. And really, you're just creating a market for usually, you know, private equity firms to sell weed in, in certain states. So I, I worry that decriminalization is, and I'm, you know, you guys can tell I'm a liberal, I'm with the Tulane or whatever. Um, I do believe that we have too many people in jails and prisons, but I think decriminalization as a rallying cry uh, can be a slippery slope because it doesn't really address root causes of inequality, particularly around uh, racial and ethnic disparities um, that we see throughout American society and specific to substance use and mental health. Yeah, I think we're uh, gone are the days in public health of the magic bullet. There's no vitamin A for this. You have to have a multi-pronged approach and it's got to go all the way from policy with Dr. Duncan's work all the way to the patient with Dr. Shukla's work. So that's super, super important. So um, 
we have some extra time and I wanted to ask you, so think of, we have some students or young people um, on our young career, uh, folks seeking careers. Is there any advice you would have for young people going into substance use, uh, either policy, treatment, public health, whatever? And maybe D Dr. Duncan, do you wanna start? Sure, I can start. So, um, you know, I fell into policy work through, um, you know, employment. So I was not trained in this. This was not something that I was trained in. I was trained in research. So, you know, I think that it's important for, you know, students who are coming out who think they might want to, you know, follow the trajectory of, you know, research to policy to practice to really try to, you know, take a course or two in public policy. You might have to go outside of the School of Public Health. You might have to go to a school of public policy to try to take those courses or a political science department. Try to get a little bit of background in that information so that way you can be more prepared than I was <laughs> to do some of this work. It's also, I think, and very important for you to continue um, talking with people who use drugs, people who work with um, people who use drugs, it's important for you to stay grounded in what the community needs mm -hmm. so that way you can respond through research, policy, and practice in a very thoughtful way. Mm -hmm. We can't sit in our offices and try to solve issues without talking to people that our policy and research and practice will affect. So that's something that's very important. Another thing that's important is continue to keep in contact with your colleagues. Like Dr. Shukla and I are now like, we're friends now because you know we had this roundabout way of getting to, to know each other. Stay in contact with colleagues because you never know what job openings they may have or they might have information on a job lead or a fellowship lead that might be interesting to you. Great, thank you, Dr. Duncan. Good words of advice, yeah, definitely. Um, Dr. Shukla? Um, I'll start by trying to answer the kind of public health side, but I, you know, my MPH is a little smaller letters than my MD, and that's just the nature of life, I guess. Um, but I would, you know, I'm, I'm in North Carolina. Um, our state DHHS is pretty awesome. I'm a, a fanboy of a lot of people there. And so I'm on the listservs, and I would say uh, there's a lot of jobs out there around substance use. Um, and I think it's because there's a lot of dollars, you know, dollars are like water. You sprinkle it in and things tend to grow. Um, and so there's all, just a lot of substance use jobs out there uh, related to overdose prevention, related to addressing stigma and bias, peer support. I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff happening. So I think, um, you know, I don't know how MPH school works nowadays. It's, I feel pretty old. My hair's looking really gray on this webinar, so that sort of sucks, but- You look younger um, than me. <laughs> it's always relative, right? right. Um, but um, I think there's just, it's good. You know, I think just general, the world of education is, I think, really behooves someone to find mentors that that you want to be, you know, people who are doing work that, like, I could grow up and do that, and then find internships and work your way into that organization. You can't really just jump into it straight out of school. That's something I learned in public health school is, I had classmates who made good grades, but didn't really work hard in their internships, and then, like, what was the point of that degree? It didn't land anywhere. So, uh, you know, public health school is, is like a professional school. It's made to help you get a job, not just learn things. Um, it's, it's both. Um, and then from the clinical side, and I don't know if this exists, maybe uh, Dr. Duncan can answer this, but on the clinical side, there's a lot of loan repayment, you know, of uh, uh, Tulane Med School. I didn't have, let's just say I didn't have any scholarships for med school. I had it for undergrad, but not med school. So with my debt, um, it was really helpful to have um, National Health Service Corps programs. And, and there's some specific programs like that for debt. Um, I'm sorry, uh, loan repayment uh, assistance if you're going into addiction care. And, and that pertains at least to clinical providers and RNs and behavioral health. But I think it also applies to public health folks. Do you all know? No, it, it does. I also okay. got um, NIH loan repayment. Yeah. So, uh, and like we could do a whole webinar. <laughs> right. So we'll so, ask Margo to organize that one. That's going to be. Yeah, the I mean, it's you know what, and it's something that's not talked about as much. And um, so yes, they do have it for people who are uh, public health folks. It's more on the research side. So I do encourage um, students to look into that. It's something that has changed my financial future. What about so where would they look? SAMHSA, Pew. So NIH. 
And NIH it, offers it. Yep. And I'll, um, you know, I'll try to multitask and, and drop it in the chat. So, um, so that way students can be aware of that, but it's a fantastic program. It is highly competitive though. So I encourage um, students who are interested in applying to make sure you talk with your professors to see if they have a student that has received NIH loan repayment and talk to others and ask them for a copy of their submission materials. It's an extremely competitive um, application. It's basically writing an uh, R01 mm -hmm. for you to get this, um, but it does, it's renewable. So yeah, Margo can organize one of these webinars. We could do a whole thing just on NH loan payment. Yeah, because we don't go into public health or substance use care uh, to get rich. <laughs> we do it because of our passion and our hope. And so um, thank you so much. I was wondering if you could see like 10 years from now, where do you see the discipline going? What do you like 10 years from now, what's going to be different or 20 years from now, where do you see it going? Or just uh, a continuation and refinement of what's already being done? Yeah, I feel that's tough because when I, the, whenever I think of that, I think of what was 10 years ago like, and um, man, the world of drugs, just just look at drug markets were so different 10 years ago and the risk of death is so scary um and you know uh the manifestations of i don't know how it is in new orleans i assume it's more cocaine than meth but in west north carolina we just have a lot of very uh, uh inexpensive and easy to access methamphetamine and manifest in a lot of public behavior so uh, just in the last year the world is the local world has changed so much let alone 10 years ago so um so, but I do see some trends. I think the country's uh, cultural vibe is, is gonna continue to embrace decriminalization, at least in marijuana, which I, I think is a step in the right direction because marijuana convictions usually harm uh, individuals and communities. I think, you know, at least the current White House, but even the previous White House really emphasized uh, evidence-based treatment, which I think is, is really great to see a bipartisan focus on that. To me, it reminds me of, of the Bush era with HIV, like, um, Despite someone's politics, the uh, HIV was very well funded uh, in the in the early 2000s, and so I, I think that's not going to go away because uh, you know addiction is not just hurting individuals and communities, certainly disproportionately uh, the folks least among us, but it's also hurting businesses and the bottom line for the economy, and uh, and so there's no there's not too many people winning with the status quo. So I think things are going to continue to change, but I also think that there's some. Um, some like heads in the sand. I don't have a smarter way to say that about this. Um, that was very like, descriptive. That was descriptive. Yeah. Well, because I was just reading recently about the DEAs trying to schedule a xylazine and, and they're trying to figure out how to regulate it. And though I don't, I'm, I'm so glad they're paying attention to this. I don't think that like, uh, you know, the, the thing about substance use is if you look back really thousands and thousands of years, humans have done things to alter their minds forever. Um, and, I, and I hate to be really graphic about this, but when I was of age, uh, less scary drugs were much more available, particularly MDMA and, and cocaine. And now it's, and, and heroin, which is essentially safer than fentanyl, but now it's all fentanyl and meth. And so it's that, you know, I hate to use that same trite term, but it's whack-a-mole. You can't really um, regulate your way out of this problem, though regulation is an important part of it. There's got to be something more fundamental. Um, we have a, and I'll say this one last thing, but we have this kind of saying in our, on our team is, because uh, I'm on the board, for instance, of a, of a local homeless services organization here in, in uh, my county, we have a saying that um, poor people do drugs in public, uh, rich people do drugs in private. And, and the, the truth is everyone's doing drugs. It's just the harm is when you are like out in the, in the elements or you're out at risk of incarceration or out at risk of getting sexually assaulted because you're intoxicated or you're living in a tent in the woods, which is where a lot of my patients here in Buckley County live. So I think there's some really fundamental issues of American society that I don't know will get worked out in the next 10 years, but I do think um, when it comes to sort of treatment access, we're on the right course. Great, thank you so much. It's great. Dr. Duncan, anything to add? Like, where do you see it going or where would you like it to go? I mean, where I would like it to go and where I see it going might be <laughs> two different things. Right, let's talk about where you would like it to go. <laughs> I mean, where I would like it to go um, is probably me saying like lobbying statements that I probably can't say um, in terms of, you know, wearing my pew hat. Um, so I'll have to tread lightly on where I would like it to go and maybe just say some of the legislation that's proposed around um, Medicaid reimbursement is an area that I think has promise. 
Okay. You know, you can read between the lines there. <laughs> I think you can, you know, areas of, um, you know, harm reduction that uh, Dr. Shukla mentioned, you know, you read between the lines there. I think that that has promise that we can um, like to see more research on that area. Now, in terms of other things that I can speak directly to, Dr. Shukla mentioned it, um, you know, stimulant, stimulant use, you know, we're seeing that, um, that trend going up and we need to respond accordingly. You know, I mentioned funding not necessarily being nimble. We've focused a lot of our attention on opioids. People don't just use one drug, right? That is not how drug use typically works. Um, stimulant use is increasing. So can we be nimble enough to now respond to increasing stimulant use when a lot of our funding has been allocated specifically for opioids? So, you know, a trend that, you know, you know, I'm seeing from a policy standpoint is people waving a red flag saying stimulant, stimulant, stimulants. How can we be nimble? How can we make sure that we're using, you know, the evidence to make sure people have access to services? Another thing that I'm seeing because I work at the, the intersection of the criminal legal system is there have been a lot more conversations, as Dr. Shukla mentioned, around do people who use drugs, do they need to be incarcerated? They need to be in treatment. They need to be in treatment in the community. That's the place where we can offer, you know, more resources to beef up our community treatment system so that way people do not end up incarcerated and receiving um, services incarcerated that they could have received in the community. So we're seeing a lot more conversations around people wanting to, you know, move people into a community treatment system, but beefing up our community treatment system so that way people actually have a place to go. Um, because that's that's a challenge for a lot of um, communities, particularly rural communities. Um, and Dr. Shukla mentioned some of his patients. You know, communities are challenged when there are no providers. There's no opioid treatment program. So let's make sure that there are opioid treatment programs and that there are providers, so that way people have access to care even in rural communities. Thank you. Th those are really excellent comments. So um, as a parent of three, well, teenagers, young adults, young adults. Um, Two 18 year old and one 21 year old. What advice? Because I, I, it's so scary to me to hear about fentanyl and, you know, yeah, kids smoke weed, but, uh, you know, getting a hold of fentanyl. Like, so what advice do you have for parents as far as how, what can we do to help our children not become addicted? Or if I or if you could answer that, we'd have to give you a million dollars or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, or more. I don't think it's such a mystery, but I also think that the research is a little old and old at this point is more than a couple of years old because the drugs have changed so rapidly. But um, and, and let me just put a, a, a plug here that uh, Nora Volkow, who's the head of NIDA, has an awesome blog and um, she has a newsletter. Oh, and good. she I'm a super fan of her. She's brilliant and um, and talks about this topic specifically. So I'm and really she's a neuroscientist, right? I think she's a neuroscientist, so she talks about the chemical in the brain and everything. Yeah, right. anyway, so go ahead. Yeah. She's also like Trotsky's great-granddaughter. Yeah. She's a fascinating person, I, and it's really awesome. She um, awesome. But I'm just parroting some of her her words here, and which is based on, you know, she has citations in her blog and on, on the website. But um, there's a number of prevention um, treatment interventions at the community level, at the individual level, that are evidence-based. And uh, granted, prevention, like most of public health, it's hard to prove your worth, right? It takes like years and decades to see a benefit and so you have to find the right metrics. But um, she on the NIDA website, there's a great uh, breakdown of dozens and dozens of programs and the research supporting uh, how they work. And some are based in schools, some are based in families, some are more community oriented, some are more of the regulatory structures, some are more like individual treatment services. So there's ways kind of from the public health lens to prevent addiction. And uh, the, the sort of short the sort of short story about this is it's reducing ACEs, which is often physical violence, sexual assault, or sexual violence, a parent incarcerated, um, living in poverty, experiencing things like racism and oppression. So less of the bad and more of the good, which we in the medical world will call, and I think the public health world call resilience building. And so that's better connections with your community, like having a uh, a real identity in your community, whether it's a religious community or uh, like a, a club or something like that. Having adult relationships that are meaningful is very uh, important. Having training of how to express emotions, so social emotional development, particularly for the really young kids, um, can last a lifetime, right? There's a lot of evidence that pre-K 
would save America, like universal pre-K would save America bazillions of dollars. Um, so we need we need that kind of at the individual level and then the kind of public health or community level, there's a variety of interventions. But I also have three kids. I didn't know that about you, Dr. Kissinger. Mine are six, four, and one and a half. Ooh. So so besides thinking about locking them in the basement for, I don't know, 20 or 30 years. Which is <laughs> and taking their the cell table, phone away. <laughs> yeah. Um, th the truth is, at least on the individual level, families that talk about things, whether it's drugs or sex, doesn't really even matter what you say, though. It matters what you say, but even just having the conversations are going to reduce the risk to your family or to your kids. And so that's how I counsel my families that I take care of as a, as a pediatric provider. Great. Um, that is awesome. So um, do you have any hopes for how good do you think the mental health and substance, well, substance use is sort of a, under the umbrella of mental health, but how good do you think we are doing with that in this country? Like on a scale of one to 10, 10 is the best ever. Well, I guess that's not really a good question. Can you identify any really good programs that we should be emulating here? The, like either European or other areas where we should be emulating? Yeah, I mean, this has been written about extensively, but um, you know, we had to break down the mental health system over decades, which you know, the old school way of inpatient institutionalization in the whatever, 40s, 50s, 60s, we don't want to repeat that, but what they did was they, they were like, oh, that's bad. Let's take away the bad without replacing it. Let's talk about replacing it. Let's create lottos, state lottos to bust, uh, you know, to, to give some foundation to education and mental health services. Just the funding never went there, right? We never mm -hmm. built an outpatient community-based mental health uh, system. And so I don't even think it's so much about the interventions because, you know, I think different people have different opinions, cognitive behavioral or medical or whatever. It's just that it's not enough. And through the pandemic, we've seen a great stress on mental health and all health providers. And we've seen people leave the field. And so we have a workforce shortage that's insane yeah. uh, across the country, in my organization, across my community, and I'm sure in New Orleans. So I think there's, you know, you can, there's different interventions, but we just don't have the people to do it. And I think it goes back to what Dr. Duncan said. It doesn't pay really well uh, at the individual level and at the organizational level. It's much better to have a hospital doing transplants and CAFs rather than providing mobile uh, or a crisis crisis management services for mental health issues. Right, great. And I'll just add, I'll add one thing to that about since Dr. Shukla mentioned kind of payment uh, from a policy standpoint, um, Virginia um, Addiction Recovery Treatment Services, their, their arts program was a way in which Virginia Medicaid like drastically increased Medicaid rates for providers and there was, and and a bunch of addiction providers started providing Medicaid reimbursable services. And so people do what you pay them to do. And so if you're increasing rates and you're increasing um, you know, the profitability for people to provide such services, providers will offer them. And this isn't unique to addiction, this is anything. You know, this, could, this isn't even uh, you know, specific to medicine or public health, this kind of, all things you pay people and they'll typically do it. So I'm, thank you so much, um, Dr. Duncan, very, uh, very true. Michael, I'm very sorry, I didn't mean to be cavalier um, saying kids will use pot. I didn't mean to be cavalier on that. They shouldn't be using pot. It doesn't, it's not good for their brain. It's not good for their development. So I did not mean, I'm just saying that I do see that they do use it. Um, I'm not saying it's a good thing. But anyway, so now we are coming to the end and I just wanted to give you all last comment. Uh, we only have about a minute left. So um, maybe uh, Dr. Duncan, you want to go first and then Dr. Shukla? Yeah, I'm, I'm really, uh, my last comment is I'm really excited for folks that have joined this um, webinar. For people who are interested in addiction research, practice, policy, please, please continue in this field. We need more folks. We need to be advocates for um, increasing access to services. We need to be advocates for people who use drugs to safely connect with medical providers. So thank you all for um, participating and continue to talk with your professors like Dr. Kissinger, um, talk to Dr. Shukla for informational interviews, talk to me for working outside of academia. You know, a lot of people do talk to me about that, um, about how can you work in addiction outside of academia? Please do not hesitate to reach out. So thank you uh, to Lane for the opportunity. Very nice, Dr. Duncan, thank you for that offer. I'm sure some people will take you up on that. Dr. Shukla, your closing words. Yeah, um, 
I, I don't know. I think we've said a lot, but I would just say my, um, I'm so gratified by my work. Um, HIV, hep C, and addiction, I just put it all into one kind of uh, one pile, but um, my experiences with patients with addiction are like some of my, my happiest work I do with patients. And I mean, I've delivered babies that all the things and I love it all, but um, addiction is such a um, window into some of the deeper issues. Uh, I would even say spiritual issues of American society. So I really love the work. And I think those of you contemplating that work will love it too. Thank goodness for you, people like you both, Dr. Duncan and Dr. Shukla, who are doing really important work and continue on. We really appreciate you doing it. And I would appreciate everyone. Thank you so much for joining this webinar. And um, we hope to see you again at some next webinar. Anyway, thank you so much.